Okay, today I'm looking at something very important. Before I speak of this uh, Jerusalem Talmud, I want to go come over here. The Jerusalem of Lithuania, Vilna in Yiddish, where uh, the guy that started the big yeshiva over in Lakewood, New Jersey, salvaged the learning of the Gaon of Vilna and planted it in Lakewood, New Jersey. Here's this uh, old magazine. It says uh, Yiddish Vilna in word and picture. And of course, there's all kinds of legendary uh, looking back to the greatness of this period. Uh, and of this place, and of course, uh, today, uh, it, the, this is carried on over there in Lakewood, in this gigantic yeshiva where you have a thousand bokarim and pairs in a big study hall studying together. And it's this guy right here, the Gaona Vilna. Now we're talking about so somebody who lived back in the time of, of James Madison. But because these people are caught in this maze of the Talmud where they live 24-7, 365. Yes. Uh, time goes by like nothing. So that by the time uh, I was born, this guy uh, who started this big yeshiva uh, went over there to Lakewood. And uh, of course, he was a Holocaust survivor from Vilna. Uh, and and And... And all of this happened uh, uh, as if it were like a month or two, when actually we're talking about a couple hundred years or more. Uh, and, and the point I'm trying to make here is that, uh, that sometimes God will um, hide these things from the wise and reveal them unto babes. Yes. And here I am, a babe. And right here in the Jerusalem Tal Talmud, it says, Ribi Yehoshua ben Levi Amar Zemach Shamo. And what is this? This is uh, up on this particular page of Berachot 17a. And it's the Jerusalem Talmud. And it proves that Zechariah chapter 6, verses 11 to 12 is a messianic prophecy. And in the Tanakh, it says the, the Messiah's personal name will be Yeshua. So, Hineish uh, Zemach Shemo. Amen. So look, friend, uh, if this is true, this changes everything. So let's get our head out of the Talmud for a, for a minute here and put our nose in the Bible. Yes. And and yes, we, we use these things. These are docking points, you might say, where the Yeshua ship might find safe harbor and take on passengers, as in the end of the book of Acts. So when you get to the Zohar, the third volume, page 288b, you have this passage that says, The ancient Holy One is revealed with three heads, which are united in one, and that one is threefold exalted. The Kedusha HaMeshuleshet. So if you, if you uh, have a big problem with this doctrine, I guess you have a problem with the Zohar because it's in the Zohar. You say, well, yeah, but you're misinterpreting the Zohar. Look, it's a bridge. A bridge is just a bridge. It's got to get you to where you're going. But here we have these, um, these, these sages with 20, 250, actually 2,500 years of sages. And, and we're trying to read the Bible with, with them as our lenses. And friend, I'm telling you, that can be very confusing after a while. This rabbi said this, and this rabbi said that. Let me just give you a rabbi. Rashi says that the one who came up to the Ancient of Days in, uh, in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, is the King Messiah. Now, if that's true, if, some, if, he, if the Baranosh is the Messiah, then friend, you need... You need to look at this. This is the Brown, Driver, and Briggs uh, Aramaic Dictionary, which says, Palak, pay lamed het, pay reverence to or serve deity. Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will not palak the uh, idols of Nebuchadnezzar, but all peoples will palak 
serve as deity, the Bar Enosh, because he is divine. He is Elohut. And uh, that's, that's the Bible. You say, oh, wait a minute. You're, you're quoting Brown, Driver, and Briggs. Uh, why don't you quote something Jewish? All right, here's uh, Marcus Jastro's uh, Aramaic uh, dictionary used by all the yeshiva bokers to serve deity, to worship. Here it is right here. Palak. The same definition. Hallelujah. The Mashiach, hallelujah, the Lord whom you, whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Uh, so uh, we're talking about El Gibor. We're talking about uh, David's Lord. We're talking about one rabbi here, uh, Saul of Tarsus, who was a student of the Tana, uh, Rabban Gamliel the Elder. He's the one that he's the rabbi you need to read. And, and 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 what I did was I studied him, and I I by the help of the Lord translated the Orthodox Jewish Bible, and this is the only translation I know of where when you get to Daniel you actually get the 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 real goods here. Pay Lamed Het. Look at this, chapter seven, verse thirteen. I'm going to read it to you. I was beholding in visions of the night, and Hine, one like a bar enosh, Moshiach, that's what Rashi says, came with the clouds of Shemayim and came to the Atik Yomin, the Ancient of Days, i.e. Hashem, and before him he was brought, and there was given him, that is Moshiach, dominion and honor and sovereignty that all people, Goyim, tongues, should pay Lamed Het. You see that? Daniel 3.12. Serve reverence as deity him. That's the Mashiach. Now this settles it, friends. Especially since his name is Yeshua. Uh, what, what more do we need? And, and I, I want to speak to you today about how good God is. Because he's revealed these things to babes. And he's hidden them from the wise. And the Lord wants you to, to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and he will lift you up. Uh, the Lord wants you to, to, to see his plan. It, it brings great glory to him if you could only see what he's doing. You know, in tennis, and I, I like to Google this, you know, the most fantastic tennis shot. Where, where your opponent is trying to serve you with a real fast serve, let's say 120 miles an hour, and you do something with a backhanded thing or whatever that is so glorious that you're actually taking what he's doing and flipping it around on him like a judo artist. Uh, this is how God has operated, and we have to see it and give him the glory. He used one Haredi ultra-Orthodox persecutor named Shaul. Amen. And boy, we got these persecutors now. We have these guys, these anti-missionaries, these, uh, these, these guys, they want to kidnap you, put you in a motel, deprogram you, harass you, and do whatever it takes to, to, to get you away from this Yeshua. Uh, but, uh, oh, hallelujah. What a glorious thing that this, this, this persecutor God used to be the great evangelist to the Goyim. Amen. So that the Goyim then could provoke the other ultra-Orthodox Jews Amen. to jealousy Amen. so that all Israel could be reconciled because God wants to reconcile the world. And Fred, he is doing it. We are not doing it. It's not about your merit, your godliness, how wonderful you are, what a great rabbi you are, how much Talmud you know, or anything about you. It's according to his call. Amen. He called yes. one man, and there were two in the womb of Rebekah. He called one to be Israel, and the other one was lost. Amen. He did it. He called Jacob. Before Jacob had done anything good or bad, before there was any merit, before there was any any uh, legalistic uh, 
uh, Machmir, uh, g- uh, goodness, uh, where you're just, oh, you're just doing so many right things and you're just so wonderful, such a good guy. No, while they were in the womb, God did it so that his glory would shine. God is in the, it, this might come as a surprise to you, but he is the sovereign God. He, he hardens whom he wants to harden. Pharaoh, he hardened. Uh, look, he, he said, I'm going to make my name great and I'm going to use this guy. What if God, in order to make his glory even greater, did, did what he wanted to do, calling this one and not that one? What if he decided to call a persecutor? And use him to to reach a bunch of uh, goyim who didn't know their left hand from their right hand, like me. Uh, and then what if what if what if these goyim could then be used to provoke all the uh, the knowledgeable, wise Gaon of Vilna type guys to come to salvation? What if that happened? Well, that's what ha- that's what did happen. That's what is happening. And I want to give God the glory. Now, I am not uh, trying to hawk this Bible and say, oh, this is the greatest Bible. This is the most wonderful Bible. No, I'm going to tell you, if you want to study the book of Romans, use this one. The New Testament in Modern Speech by R.F. Weymouth. This this is the the best that I know of. A translation of Romans because he goes through and he shows that merit is the culprit. When people think they have merit, when people think that they have uh, something they can boast about, that they can make God, put God in their debt, that God now has to play ball with them because they have done all these works and now God has to acknowledge their works and their merit and, and smile on them no, that is, that is not the way it works at all. Salvation is a free gift so that no one can boast, friend, so that no Jew, no non-Jew, no, not me, not you, not anybody, no one can boast. It's all a wonderful gift from God. God so loved the world that he gave, he gave his one and only, his ben Yochid, so that whosoever if you could just wrap your mind around this, what a miracle it is that you are a believer. Well, how God had to move heaven and earth to save someone like you. And that, that in these last days, he's going to save so many more people. And he wants to use you. That's why he... There's a reason the Bible is read and studied more than any other book ever written. The fact is, there's no other book like the Bible. Let me give you an example. In Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, the Baranosh is said to be worshipped. Worshipped as deity. Do you see this word here? Pay Lamed Het. It's an Aramaic word. All peoples will pay Lamed Het, the Baranosh, when he comes on the glory clouds, to the Atik Yomim. Now, if you flip over here, uh, Daniel 3.12, you find out that the three friends of Daniel will not palak the idols. You can find this word again in uh, chapter 3, verse 18, I believe. They will not palak the idols of Nebuchadnezzar. So what does this tell you? This tells you that uh, the Baranosh Mashiach, and Rashi tells us that that, in, in his uh, writings, Rashi tells you that the Baranosh is the Rebbe Melech HaMashiach. So this tells you one, uh, two things. Number one, that the Baranosh, Rebbe Melech HaMashiach, is not an idol. And number two, he is God, because he is to be worshipped and served as deity, unlike the idols. Now, you may have a question about this, but just remember this. Uh, Mashiach will not see shahat. He will not see putrefaction. Psalm uh, 16, verse 10. Shahat. Sheen, 
Kurt Tav. He will not see decay. He will not see corruption. After he's in the care the Lord will prolong his days. Isaiah chapter 53. Uh, the word kever is there, and the word uh, for prolong his days is there. Uh, also, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, he will see light or uh, in the Isaiah Scroll, which is older than the Masoretic text. So the resurrection of the Mashiach, the Tehiyas HaMashiach, is there, and it is also here. Now, if you have a body in putrefaction over in Old Montefiore Cemetery, he is not the Messiah. And all your zeal for him is idolatry and worthy of, uh, basically, I hate to say this, but damnation, my friend. Uh, if you want to promote a false Messiah, you're, you're in trouble with God. Now, uh, look at this word here, Palak, right here. Pelamid Het. This is the Marcus Jastrow uh, Standard Aramaic Dictionary. This this Aramaic word palak means to serve. See that word deity to worship, uh, and it gives several references here from the Talmud from the Targum. Deity. So the object of the verb is not a mere man. We're not having uh, Mr. Jones on the glory cloud coming to the Atikyo mean. And uh, the uh, Talmud. Oh, you say, well, wait a minute, it says in the Talmud that the Mashiach's name will be Menachem. Look. In Sanhedrin, um, it says, Rava created bara. Well, right there you have heresy. Only God can bara. You show me one place in the, in the, uh, Tanakh, where anybody but God does a bara. Uh, uh, Gavra, a gever, a man, a golem, and uh, sent him to uh, Rabbi Zerah. And, uh, you know, this, this Zerah would speak to him, but he would not answer. Uh, then uh, you're of the pietists or of the group there. Return to your dust. The word dust here. Uh, it's in the th next line here. So, uh, what are we saying here? We're saying that this has Buba mindset in it. You cannot go, you cannot stake your immortal soul on a book that has Buba mindset. You can't do it. Now, uh, I would really like for you to go to uh, the AFI app, AFII app, and download it because it has all these resources you can look at. And one thing that you definitely need to look at is the post exilic Cohen Gadol who comes back. From the Golas, and uh, what is his name? His name is Yehoshua. Yeshua, uh, uh, Ezra three eight is the Aramaic translation of his name, Joshua or Yehoshua. 
And uh, what does he do? He uh, is confronted by the prophet Zahariah. And you see his name here, Yehoshua. Ezra 3 8 translates it Yeshua. When Zahariah comes up to him, he doesn't say, Oh, Yushka, Yeshu, ha, 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 yeah. We don't, we don't mention your name in our house. We, you know, we, we think you're, you got a bad name. No, he says, Hine Ish, Zemach Shemo. Zemach Shemo. Your name is the Zemach. And um, in Jastro, if you look at it, it actually tells you that uh, this is the allegorical name of the Mashiach. And uh, let me just show you here. Zemach. Allegorical name of the future Mashiach. That it gives you the Jerusalem uh, Talmud. And it gives you the reference. Now. This is important because. Here. Zechariah is saying. You, Yehoshua, are the namesake. That means the name source for the coming name target of the Moshiach. Uh, and, uh, and that means that the, when the Moshiach comes, his name has been identified, his personal name. Now, if you want to take the Talmudic reference to Menachem, and uh, you want to prefer that to the biblical uh, reference that you have here in Zechariah 6, 11, and 12, then you are Shmad. Because you're taking the word of man over the word of God, and you are basically tearing this this page out of your Tanakh. And you're saying, I know better than Zechariah. The, the Mashiach cannot have this name. Well, you do not know better than, than him. You're right if you say Mashiach is Elohut. You're wrong if you say that Mashiach's name is Menachem. And unfortunately for you, this is an error that you will regret for all eternity. And if you are promoting a Moshiach Sheker, then you are actually dragging other people into Gehinom with you. Because everyone who says, yeah, you're right, and believes, their blood is on your hands. You say, you have no idea what it would cost me to preach what you're saying. Well... Uh, this life is very short, and whatever you whatever you accumulate in this life will soon be dragged away from you, and you will go off into eternity without one penny. And all your friends and all your family, you will have to say goodbye to. Do you want eternal life, Haye Olam? Do you want uh, what cannot be taken away from you? Is, are the scriptures important to you? Are you really Jewish? Are you pagan at heart? If you're really Jewish, you will accept what the scriptures say. The scriptures say that uh, the Mashiach, uh, the, the namesake of the Mashiach will be Yahushua. This man was resurrected from the death of the Golas. He was raised up alive. Yosef High. Israel High, 1948. Moshiach High, 3793. Nisan 16. This book, we're putting all over Crown Heights. This book preaches the truth. This is a Lubavitcher translation. Lord, I want to pray right now that some Israeli who is in a cult, who is completely uh, brain dead, uh, his, his mind has been taken over by a demonic kind of 
thing that has done mind control on him. Lord, that he will have his eyes opened by the Ruach HaKodesh, that he will see that when the Zohar says uh, that the, 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 the head, there's one head, and it, the ancient Holy One is revealed with three heads, which are united in one, and that one is threefold exalted. Uh, Zohar 3, 288 288b. Lord, I want to pray that when they understand that this is uh, a, an explication of the Godhead, that this is a bridge that we can use to preach the Basurah Sargeh Allah, that this is Jewish, that this is Judaism. Forget, forget what the Zohar says other than that. We're talking about just this, 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 these five words. Lord, I pray that they will come to a saving knowledge of the, of the truth. That when Yohanan looked into the grave, he saw the Takrahim had collapsed like a deflated balloon. He saw the, the shape of the body of the Moshiach in this deflated cocoon, this, this mummy-like wrapping of the Takrahim uh, linen wrappings. And he saw the Mitznefeth uh, head wrapping neatly folded up right where the head would be. And he saw that no one could have extricated him from that. No, no body snatcher, no grave robber could have taken him out of there. He had obviously dematerialized and materialized outside the cocoon of the Takrahim. And then he neatly folded the a head wrapping and then dematerialized again and then began his appearances where in the upper room the the door was locked and then he suddenly appeared in their midst he materialized in their midst and he made all those all those appearances but even before the appearances Yohanan was already a believer because he saw the Takrahim and he knew that no one could make that great escape unless they were the Mashiach if you're wrapped like a mummy, you can't get out of the encasement unless you dematerialize. And he did that, obviously, and he materialized. Lord, I pray that they will go to Johanna chapter 20, that they will look at the Orthodox Jewish Bible, afi.org forward slash capital O, capital J, capital B dot PDF. And they will see this and they will come to faith like, like Johanan did. And they will preach Mashiach until all the Lubavitchers turn, and then the 144,000 will evangelize the entire world. And we thank you for this, Lord, in Yeshua's name, amen. It's just one, two, three, four, five words. I want you to look at Base Tav, Lamed, Tav, Resh, Yod, Sheen Yod Final Noon, and then Vav Kaf Lamed Yod Lamed Final Noon, and then Base Het Dalit, and then Resh Yod Sheen Aleph. Now, this is found Zohar uh, this is the Amsterdam edition 288b the third volume and um, these words These uh, particular words are telling you three heads united in one head. Very simple. And it's talking about the Godhead. 
three heads to uh, united in one head. That's what it's saying. This is the Sefer HaZohar, the Amsterdam edition. Three heads united in one head. And this is what we believe. This is Judaism. Now, if you go to afii.org forward slash Zohar 3N1.pdf, you will see this in the Rashi script, which is a little harder to read, but we also have it in Hebrew so that you can actually look at it both ways. I hope you will do this, and I hope you will see that Moshiach, because of Daniel's writings in chapter 3 and chapter 7, is a divine personage. He is not a human being. He Mit Gashem takes on flesh as a human being, but he is from of old, from everlasting. And this is Rebbe Melech HaMoshiach. Today I'm speaking about Isaiah chapter 14, verse 11, which says, and this is speaking about the, the king of Babylon. Uh, it's this evil... Uh, Principality, it, it, Lucifer is also uh, a name here that we're talking about, hell, and it says your pomp, your pride, your strutting pomp is brought down to Sheol, and the sound of your stringed instruments, the maggot is spread under you, and worms, this word uh, for worms is also found in the last verse, their worm never dies. Uh, the worms cover you. Uh, everyone should go to embalming school and they should find out what rigor mortis means. They should see pictures of corpses. They should try to understand what is involved in the decay of the body. They should follow a grave digger around. They should see bodies exhumed. They should see what a body looks like after the uh, vault has been opened and the uh, putrefaction is, is examined. They need to smell rot, the, the rotting stench. I, 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 I have a few teenagers here that are getting ready to pass out. You know, it's not funny, Fred, because we're talking about you. We're talking about your body, where your soul resides. And basically, the scriptures give you an ultimatum. It's either martyrdom or maggots. Take your choice. Because if you go to the mikvah and you go under the mikvah, uh, you are a martyr who is basically saying, I've given up my life. I'm giving it to the Lord. I'm getting out of the driver's seat. This, this life that I have, this body, this, this dying body is now the property of Yeshua. And I will live in the body in a way that will please the Lord. And, and as far as my own life is concerned, as far as my life is concerned, it is finished. It is the, my body now belongs to the Lord. He's the Lord of the body. The Mashiach has me, and I give myself to him. The body is not for fornication. The body is, is not for uh, idolatry. The body is not for uh, gluttony or, uh, or the miser's uh, uh, love of money. The, the body is for the Lord. And when you give your body to the Lord, it's the same as martyrdom. And, and actually, the mikvah, the mikvah maim, is a martyr's uh, uh, ordeal. Uh, when, when you go under the water, you're saying, my, my body is now buried with him and risen with him. Now, if you don't want to go that route, if you want to try to hang on to your body and your life, if you want to be like a famous singer who said, I don't need him. I've got my own life and I've got my drugs and I've got my enablers for my drug habit. And I'm going to just let my body be the repository 
of my quaaludes and all my prescription drugs and my alcohol, and, and I'm going to uh, 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 have my career and my body. Well, let me tell you about your body. Let, I want to go into the body. I want you to know what rigor mortis is. Within three hours of your death, there will be a stiffening. And if you die in a strange position, you will stiffen like a statue, like, an, like a grotesque statue in that position. If the, mort if the mortician doesn't do, do some things right away, you're, you're going to, you're, you're, the color, the blood coming to, uh, up from the skin is going to discolor your face. And, uh, you know, when Patton was in his Jeep going through Nazi Germany, he saw all, all these frozen soldiers and they, their faces were blue with the, the blood. Uh, the mortician will try to drain that out. But let me tell you something, even the embalming fluid will not stop the putrefaction. The maggots will come, friend. Yes, they will come and they will eat your flesh. And, and here, what does it say in chapter 14, verse 11? It says, thy pomp is brought down to the grave and the noise of thy stringed instruments. The worm is spread under thee. It's talking about the maggots in a house flies different cycles, one cycle is the maggot. Those little worms that just eat everything. Yes, they feed on the flesh and they will feed on you. You say, oh, I don't want that to happen to my body. I, I hope to have an airtight uh, casket. I hope I have a concrete vault. I hope that somehow that is avoided. Well, short of, short of uh, cremation, I don't know how you could avoid that. Because those maggots are coming for you. And, and you're, you're, you're only a very, uh, you're in this body, you're, you're like someone jumping on a subway. You're just a, a very transient rider. You're here today and gone tomorrow. You have to make, you have to get right with God. You have to ask the Lord to, to take your, who, he says, who will deliver me from this body of death? That's a, one of the verses right there in Romans. Who will deliver me? Look, this, this, this evil Lucifer, it says, the worm is spread under thee. In other words, you're laying on a blanket of worms, and the worms cover thee. Uh, it's talking about the, the maggots that you're lying on and, and, the, and the worms that is your, 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 your blanket. This man who had known only luxury, only expensive uh, couches and, and carpets, this is, this is the way his, his life will end. And, and you've got to make a decision today. Is it going to be mar uh, uh, the martyr's mikvah or the, or, or the grave's maggots? You've got to ask the Lord. Uh, are you ready to give up, to let go and let God? Are you ready to give your life to the Lord? Listen, one of the things I had to do before I gave my life to the Lord, because believe me, man, I was holding on to my life till the, till the bitter end. I had a friend who had been in my high school, and he was a mortician. And I, I wrote him a letter, and I said, would you let me borrow your mortician's manual, one of the, one of the uh, uh, books that you had to study to get your mortician's license? He said, sure, you can have it for a couple of weeks, but you got to send it back to me. I said, no problem, I will definitely do that. And so he mailed it to me, and I began to look at it. I had a Bible over here, but I had a mortician's manual here. And I started looking at all of these grotesque bodies, bodies being embalmed, bodies that had had, uh, had terrible uh, disfigurement from the automobile accidents, bodies in rigor mortis, bodies in the casket, bodies uh, uh, laying on the slab of the uh, embalming room in the, uh, where, where the uh, mortician does his work. Uh, uh, young girls, old women, young boys, old men, mi middle-aged people, uh, people that didn't look very well educated and people that looked very, very dignified. They were all uh, uh, in the, in the um, uh, embalmer's uh, room on his embalming slab. Fred, this is reality. Do you understand? I'm talking about reality. I'm preaching Isaiah chapter 14, verse 11. I'm talking about your rotting life, your rotting corpus, your, your rotting uh, corpse, your, your, your rotting uh, carcass. I'm, I'm talking about you. This is you we're talking about. 
And, and it doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor, whether you're young or old, this could come at any time. You're only one heartbeat away from the horror that I'm talking about. I wish that you could follow a, a, uh, a grave digger around and, and let him go into an old cemetery where they really didn't even have good caskets and dig until you hit something hard. Then you see something down uh, uh, maybe uh, six feet under and it's just a plastic bag and you open it up and the horrendous odor comes up and assaults you and you immediately have a gagging reaction and you want to throw up and maybe you do throw up because this is, this is where you're going without Yeshua HaMashiach. Listen, friend, it says in Psalm 16, he did not see Shachat. Everything I've described, he did not see. His body did not rot. Your body will rot. His body did not rot. And those of you who are Jews for Judaism, who are spending all of your time trying to talk people out of eternal life and out of the resurrection body that the Mashiach modeled for you, you people are fools. You are the worst kind of fool. Like vultures who prey on simpletons and are not happy until you've drugged somebody off into hell. Look, if you don't want to go to heaven, if you want to go to hell, if you want to rot in hell, if you want to rot where it says their worm does not, their worm does not die. The last verse of Isaiah, their worm does not die. If you want to be where maggots never die, well, then you can go there. But why would you try to talk other people into doing that? The resurrection of the Mashiach is one of the best attested things of antiquity. We don't have that many witnesses that wrote down about what Julius Caesar did when he crossed this river or that river. He may have done it. We believe he did do it. There were people who saw him do it. But as far as the witnesses that actually wrote it down and as far as having that material in our hands, we don't have it. Not like this, over 500 people at one time. All these martyrs that wrote their testimony in blood. The New Testament is written by martyrs' blood, friend. The ink dipped in martyrs' blood. And you have a choice today. You can either dip in the mikvah of the martyr and give your life to the Lord and give him this, this, this hulking flesh that you have. Give it to him. Or you can hang on to it. Whoever tries to keep his life will lose it. Do you hear what I'm saying? If you try to keep your life, you will lose it. You will lose it to the maggots. You will lose it to the grave worm. You, you will lose it to Gehinom. You will lose it to the eternal fire. Eternal fire. And this passage I'm reading to you is in Isaiah chapter 14. And he knew very much about David. And when Nathan confronted David and said, well, wasn't it enough that I took you from, from tending to the flocks and running after the sheep and I gave you a palace and I made you a king and I gave you uh, all these uh, wonderful things? Is it, if it had not been enough, I would have given you even more. But you so despised my word you so despised my word that you took another man's wife and then you murdered him and committed adultery. And then you tried to, to uh, uh, you know, put it under the rug and, and you thought you could get away with it. But Nathan is here with the word of God telling you that God was watching all the time. God is watching you, friend. He's looking at you right now. He's looking at your heart. And he, he's looking into the future. He's seeing the maggots eating your flesh. He's seeing your soul in torment in hell. And he wants you to turn to him. He's not willing that any should perish. But he wants everyone to come to salvation. He, 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 he would rather you be a martyr and be in heaven or even take a martyr's right and go under the mikvah and join him than to spend eternity where you're going. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. David didn't know who he was dealing with when he sent his servants to get that woman and bring her to him, and she came to him. Oh, yes, she came to him. She wasn't just 
uh, procured, she willingly came. And she willingly committed adultery. And they were two willing culprits. And God saw it. And he sees your heart today. And he sees the wickedness of your heart. And he's not willing that you should perish. He wants to save you from the maggots, from the fire, from eternal perdition, from the torment, from the worm that does not die and the fire that can't be quenched. And I want you to pray this with me right now. And get serious with God. Get serious with God. I don't have that in Bomber's manual anymore. I can't show you all those pictures of your future. All I can do is plead with you to pray with me. Would you ask the Lord to come into your heart right now and forgive your sins? Just say this with me. Everyone praying together. Dear God, Dear God. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I know there's a worm. I know there's maggots. I know there's perdition in hell. Save me, Lord. I give my life to you. I turn away from everything that holds me to this world. And I give my body to you, Lord. I give my mind to you. I give my soul to you for you to take it. And, oh, God, save it and preserve it for heaven. That's why you died. That's why you rose from the dead. Thank you, Yeshua HaMashiach, Ben Dovid. And everybody said amen.